Hello, everybody. My name is Estefania Bravo, Treasury Marketing Coordinator at High Radius, and I'm very happy to present Scaling Up Receivables Forecasting at Danone North America with Artificial Intelligence here at ACT Conference. Please welcome Jacob Whetstone from Danone North America and Juan Saudino from High Radius. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to be here um, with you. So yes, I'm Jacob Whetstone. I am a director of our invoice to cash department at Dino North America. So that invoice to cash, we cover our credit collections, cash application, um, cash forecasting and deduction management and uh, some other things. So yeah, grateful to be here. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, my name is Juan, Juan Saldino, VP of Professional Services for uh, High Radius in Consulting. So my team oversees the implementation of all our customers on the treasury space. So today what we're going to do is we're going to go through a, a, an agenda quickly here is we're going to talk about the known and specifically about the known North America, um, which uh, Jacob oversees. Then we're going to talk about the cash forecasting process and what were the challenges and implications that drove the known uh, selecting high radius for forecasting. We're going to discuss how cash forecasting uh, is done with artificial intelligence. And then we're going to have a, a small uh, discussion about artificial intelligence 101 and how that is applied to uh, CAD forecasting. So let's start off with um, a little bit of introduction about the So Jacob, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, so Danone is a, is a global company um, where food manufacturer makes food and, and beverages. So our mission, as you can see, is bringing health through food to as many people as possible. So really our goal is to provide uh, healthy and nutrition nutritional products to to individuals to our consumers. Um, so, from a global perspective, we have um, over 100,000 employees in 55 different countries. Um, our products are available in over 120 countries, and we're the number one worldwide leader in our fresh dairy products. So, I'm specifically, as was mentioned, over to Nor to known North America. So, covering our businesses in the United States and Canada. Um, both with our traditional known products, as well as our waters and our medical nutrition business, our nutrition business. Um, so that's just a little bit about Danone as a company. Um, and then as far as, um, you know, especially what will be covered today, kind of our treasury landscape, or more specifically where the cash forecasting piece comes in. So we have the accounts receivable that provides our cash in forecast and our accounts payable that provides our cash out forecast to our, our US cash management team who takes all those inputs in and then uh, presents that to our global team who will then take all those inputs from the different regions and, and report out on those. So that's just you know how we're set up a little bit from, from that landscape. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, before we start, um, and this is for everyone, before you start your uh, automation journey as it relates to your forecasting process, it's always important to, first of all, identify uh, the why, what, and how about forecasting. So we need to always start with identifying the purpose of the cash forecasting, and that normally uh, responds to, to the why. The what in terms of uh, the frequency, accuracy, and what are your metrics that you're looking to improve and solve, and then following by uh, how we do it. So. With that in mind, Jacob, why don't you uh, walk us through um, the receivable process forecasting uh, for Deno North America and how uh, your role was critical to, to the implementation itself? Yeah, for sure. So to start out, just going over some of the objectives that we have for our cash forecasting uh, process. So it's really to be able to provide uh, a forecast so that we can provide guidance to our stakeholders of what our free cash flow um, where we're going to land with that free cash flow number. And of course, with that, as with any forecast, accuracy is the key with that. And so, again, as we are a shared service center and in North America and manage different companies and different entities, being able to have that accuracy at that entity level and then looking at it to be really accurate, both at a weekly um, and daily cash flow level. So just being able to really drill down and, and understand with, with great accuracy um, where we're going to land at those different time frames. So our, our current process um, for forecasting cash uh, was quite quite involved and, and quite manual. And so really it was taking the inputs from our different data sources. So from the bank files, being able to understand the cash in and what we're seeing coming in from the bank, 
Um, we currently, and we've previously been customers of High Radio, so both with their Cash App uh, collections and deduction modules. So being able to take the information out of High Radius, um, and then as well as our ERP system, which we're an SAP workshop. So taking in the data out of, of those different sources, putting it into just Excel and manually trying to gather that data um, and get the cash forecasting information that we needed there. So we had a dedicated person who was a credit analyst at the time who would take all those inputs, again, using Excel and trying to come up with a cash forecast. So a very manual process, um, pulling in lots of different data sources and just really trying to use Excel was the only tool that we were using when we were trying to spit out a cash forecast um, to present to our, our global company. Um, so when we were looking at that data, um, we would take historical data, so past year's collections information, and we were really trying to figure out a days to pay by customer level. And so using what's happened in the past to figure out how long it would take our customers to pay us, we were using current information as well from our high radius system and, and from our bank files to get the what cash has currently been applied um, so that we could see, and then of course what was open, but using that applied cash to be able to see, okay, so we have the, the historical information, we have the current information, what changes happen there, what assumptions do we need to take, plus we have our open invoices to figure out what's going on, and then putting that all into Excel, and again, having a credit analyst try to, to take into account all these, app, these inputs to come up with their forecast. So it was very time consuming, it was inefficient, it was 100% manual, and we had a lot of, we didn't have a lot of insights into what was going on at an invoice level. Um, but then also, we didn't have one of the inputs that we, we struggled with and that we didn't have was invoices that hadn't generated yet. So being able to, we were having the current open invoices into our forecast, but invoices that hadn't even generated yet. So um, we have pretty short terms where a product um, is consumed very quickly. And so we, we had to stick to a short-term for, forecast because we couldn't use invoices that hadn't generated yet um, as part of that forecast. And so those assumptions would even make our forecast even more accurate if we tried to do that. So it was very challenging, uh, a lot of challenges with that and a very manual process for us. As I mentioned, some of the different challenges already, but again, very manual. A lot of uh, errors happened um, because you know it was all done by a person that, that would make mistakes or make bad assumptions. So it was a hit miss approach. Um, we had very poor variance analysis. So again, everything being done manually. So being able to check things, how to go through manually. And we were having a hard time track root cause because there was just so much data um, and being able to identify, uh, identify which invoices generated the, the poor variants and being able to track those down to address those problems. And, and again, as I mentioned, we were, because of the lack of data that we had, we had to look into just um, a small time frame to do that. And so because we couldn't forecast out very far in advance, we were only doing this twice a year. So looking at just a monthly forecast twice a year to provide that information uh, back to our, our company with because it was just such a manual and efficient process um, to be able to figure out what was going on. And then even as we were forecasting, we were going about collecting the, the invoice as well, but we didn't have a good uh, process to be able to get that collected information back to help our forecast as well. Um, and then again, manually how to calculate DSO or days to pay to try to find different patterns. And then some of the other challenges that we had that brought into this is we knew that customers weren't going to be paying the full amount of the invoice. They were going to take deductions or different short payments in there. So being able to understand how we take into account the deductions of those short payments into our forecast, as well as any early payments. So as we're trying to hit free cash flow numbers, um, there were opportunities where we had customers who were willing to pay early. Um, and so being able to take into account any early payment adjustments that we had. And again, what we're basing on historical data where there were no early payments, and then all of a sudden now we're having early payments, it really just threw a wrench into our process and made it very difficult to figure out what we we're going to do. So a lot of challenges with our current process for sure. Um, and again, just kind of going over some of the same things. The decisions were limited um, based off just the information that we had. A lot of human judgment and assumptions went into place. We had not a lot of confidence in our daily forecasting specifically 
Um, we felt that we got pretty good at maybe some of the, the weekly stuff, but actually from a daily perspective, even made it a little bit harder. Again, very short term, we had to do it less than a month because our terms were very short and we didn't even know what invoices were still being generated that would come in that month. So we had to do very short term forecasting. Um, and again, just a lot of inefficiencies in order to try to hit our targets and be able to get a, a forecast up that we could feel somewhat good about. So when we were looking into finding a solution that could tackle all these problems for us, of course, we wanted something that would be very automated, that we could take a lot of that manual work out and we could feel good about um, the work that the person was doing and switch them from just spending all their time calculating a forecast to doing more value-added activity. So we wanted to achieve end-to-end -end automation in the forecasting. So for the full process where we could automate it to where, you know, hopefully as simple as just pushing a button and getting a forecast. Um, and with that, being able to improve the cadence. As I mentioned, we were only doing it twice a year because of the challenges and the struggles that we had with it. So being able to have a system that could automate it for us so that we could pull it anytime um, that we wanted to. And so increasing that cadence. And then again, where we're a shared service center and working different companies, being able to really make sure that we could pull it across the different company codes for the individual BUs so that we could get down to specific cash forecasting for each of the businesses that we support in. So with those challenges in front of us, um, you know, we went out to try to find a, a best in class solution to help with our cash forecasting process and one where we can use the advanced technology that's out there. And so um, we, we ended up using High Radius to help us with this. So again, the inputs were still the same, still pulling from our bank files, our High Radius system that we already had in place, as well as our ERP system. Um, but being able to have this, the, our solution or High Radius do that for us. So we would go out and pull those data points for us, um, run it through their, their cloud cash forecasting cloud and being able to take the data, do a lot of the, the uh, manipulations there, a lot of the calculations. And then our credit analysts would then come in after that and perform any checks or any reviews or anything that needs to happen at that point. But that credit analyst isn't spending the time gathering the data, doing the calculations or any of that piece. The system itself is doing all of that and doing that intelligently with some of the technology and artificial intelligence that, that we have out there. Um, so that that forecast that the, cash, that the credit analyst is looking at is much better and much stronger before they're even getting to it at that point. Yeah, with that essentially we, we work through uh, a traditional implementation methodology, but um, without diving into the specific details of all the different phases, there's this three key parts of implementation that for a project like this, they're critical. And we heard um, Jacob talk about a lot of data, a lot of data points, um, the volume of data made, the process of uh, forecasting on a more frequent basis, very time consuming, and sometimes not even practical. So that's where having a data scientist team uh, that basically will go through all those uh, data points. And normally uh, for a project like this and forecasting, you require at least uh, two years uh, worth of these historical data, or hopefully three. So analyzing all that data for all those customers, there's a lot of invoice detail and deductions and, and, and credit memos and so on. So having a team that basically works through all that analysis uh, has a deep understanding of uh, the current process as we had uh, many sessions with, with Jacob on identifying how um, his team uh, did forecasting today, what were the data points, some of the complexities around their individual business processes and, and uh, the nature of their customer payment behavior all that data should be used to uh, build models and build models that are very uh, highly accurate uh, to predict um, their forecast. So with that, then once we had that portion done, essentially we went through a traditional uh, parallel testing where uh, we, we opened up to the, for the users to test the system. Uh, at that point, they will, they will re, uh, look at their own current process, the as is, uh, Excel-based process that they had uh, before the implementation and compare that against uh, the results of the system we're producing. But Jacob, in, th in this case, given you, you had a um, twice a year forecasting uh, period where you needed to report numbers up to corporate, then how was that critical in terms of timing, right? Because you didn't, you didn't have like uh, making the timing work for, for your uh, existing forecasting process was, was critical as well. Right? Yeah, so yeah, so one of the, the 
big benefits that we had from this was this parallel testing that we could still hit our, our timeframes that we had of doing it twice a year and reporting up to our corporate, but being able to look and feel confident about what was going on through this testing process. So we could see what the output was coming from high radius, as well as what we were doing with our current process and being able to use the Excel models that we had already developed and being able to um, sort of compare each one and pit each other one against each other and be able to see which one came out with the best process. And it actually helped us out to be able to, even during this time of testing and we were doing it parallel, to see some of the differences that we had between the two approaches and, and being able to come up with even a better forecast as we were looking at the two different uh, factors of, or the two different methodologies um, when we were trying to report that up at that time. So it really helped us out to be able to develop confidence in what Hyradius was doing for us and in this new technology um, by seeing the benefits that we were getting from uh, against our current process. And then of course, seeing the how easy it was to get it versus what we were doing manually was a huge aspect of that as well. So, so yeah, for us, and again, where we were existing high radius customers, um, all of the data was already there because of the other high radius modules that we had. So we were able to have uh, a, an immediate kickoff um, and being able to have that data that we had years of history with high radius to be able to pull that in and really have that immediate kickoff, see the benefits from it, and then adopt it into our current day-to-day -day processes pretty immediately after that fact, once we felt confident that the, the results were, were good, being able to process that into our daily processes, both of the two times a year that we were doing it, but then also as we were able to see some of the benefits, which we'll get into a little bit later, being able to integrate that into some of our daily processes and using it more often as, as mentioned before, so. As I kind of uh, mentioned previously, there were different challenges that came into play of some of the, the changes in the input that we had to take into account. And so one of those was the deduction or those short payment aspects where we were trying to get the information that were coming off the invoice to show the total cash amount that we were expecting to come in. But we knew that customers weren't going to pay that full amount because of deductions um, that they were owed that they were going to take, as well as maybe other deductions or short payments that they felt that they were owed that they were going to take. And so we, we brought in this, um, these pre-deductions. And again, the idea with the pre-deductions, there are deductions that are going to happen that haven't happened yet to help just further refine um, the accuracy that we were seeing with our forecast. So as we were able to pull in the forecast without so first of all, doing it without the pre-deductions, you can kind of see the results there, both are on our weekly accuracy as well as our monthly accuracy. And then as we pulled in those pre-deductions, um, able to see a big increase in the accuracy in both our weekly and monthly activity or uh, accuracy. So, so overall, being able to take into those factors and again, having the system do it for us so that we weren't trying to manually create this, which was a very hard number for us to come by manually. Um, been able to have the system do it, we were able to improve our accuracy uh, pretty good just by bringing those in as well. And then the same thing um, with the early payments. So again, there are times when the customers would, would pay early or we had a chance to talk to them to pay early for us. And so being able to, uh, again, look at some of those, those options and being able to pull in those early payments or realize that those opportunities were there. And then as we pull those in, being able to further increase the accuracy of the forecast um, and make those adjustments. So again, where we were trying to forecast based off historical knowledge and historical data of how the customers paid, and then someone would come in and pay early, that would uh, mess up what had been done historically. And so being able to make those adjustments within the system um, to again, just further improve our both our weekly and our monthly accuracy. So that was a big deal for us as well as to bring in these early payments. So kind of how it all ended out for us. So this is, you know, a big deal for us. So the results, we were able to achieve our accuracy up to 96% accuracy in, in our monthly forecasts, which was a, a huge increase for us. Um, and again, that accuracy came without a lot of additional work on our end. So having the system do it all for us, which, which was that decrease in about 30% of the time that we had spent in some of those manual trivial tasks. So we could re allocate the resources that we had trying to come up with this forecast to doing some more of the value added activity. Um, plus, as, as I mentioned, we had a hard time 
being able to forecast out very long term. So, um, but with this solution now, we can forecast out up to six months if we need to, um, and being able to go beyond much further than what we were ever ever able to do before. Um, we have that full end-to-end -end automation that we we're looking at, being able to to have that forecast across regions. It's very efficient for us. Again, really just looking at it, uh, kind of click of the button thing that we can get that forecast out because it's all automated for us. And then being able to spend some of that savings time that we had on a lot more of that variance analysis. So being able to see what the system had of what High Radius said should be paid and didn't get paid, we could go out and look at those specific invoices, follow up with a customer, but we were also able to be a little bit more proactive too and see some of the invoices that High Radius was saying are not going to be paid. And if we really needed that cash in, we could go back to those customers on those specific invoices and make sure that we secured that cash. So being able to go to the customer and say, hey, you know, I see that this invoice is coming due. Um, you know, usually we get your check or your, your money a couple of days later. Is there any way we can push this forward and try to partner with our customers to get that cash pulled forward if we need to? Um, but we could really understand at that invoice level what was making up that forecast, both from the probability of something being paid Again, so that we could really focus our collectors as we're trying to hit these numbers um, at the end of the months and especially at the end of the semesters to more proactively go out to our customers and being able to either get the cash in or follow up to understand what's going on as to why some of these, these delays, these payments are going to be delayed. And so we were able to dive in a lot deeper with that because of this variance analysis that the system helped generate for us. So yeah, uh, you know, we found a lot of benefits um, with an artificial intelligence-based cash forecasting. Um, and again, some of these I already touched on a little bit, but really being able to, to have our team focused on the higher value added tasks and not so much the manual things, a lot better accuracy, both short-term and long-term. Um, the system just handling a lot of the fluctuations and the variances with that, so we got better accuracy. Um, and being able to have a highly customized forecast model where we could filter, um, look at adding in early payments as well as the deduction standpoint and being able to have it just do exactly what we needed it to and feel confident with the inputs that we we're putting in. And then the forecast, again, going from a one month or even less than one month in some cases to up to six months, um, having a forecast that we feel very good about and that we feel confident with. And then again, being able to track those, um, as I mentioned, some of those variances with the invoice level um, that would help improve our collections and, and overall help our targets being able to understand the probability that each of those invoices would be paid in or not. So, so overall, a lot of benefits that we saw um, with an easy implementation for us with our, our partnership with HiRadius and being able to get those improvements all across the board um, by using an artificial intelligence-based cash forecasting system. Well, thank you, Jacob. This has been a great experience uh, for all of us. So now let's let's look at we talk about the, the why, the what, and, and, and in some respects, the how, right? So looking at uh, how do we use artificial intelligence in the con uh, context of uh, cash forecasting? So normally we start with a very simple um, goal, right? So we have a customer that we issued an invoice to, and we need to try to predict when that invoice is gonna get paid. Seems pretty simple uh, at first hand. As we go into trying to predict that day, then essentially we're gonna, we start with an easy approach where we take the, just the invoice day, the average date to pay, for example, across all my customers. And I'm gonna come up with a prediction. That's probably not gonna be very accurate because I'm just taking an average across multiple customers and customers might have different payment terms, different conditions. So then I, I start adding an additional variable, right? So now I have invoice date, an average date to pay, but now I want to look at that specific customer payment behavior. How do they pay? What are the payment terms and conditions? Uh, so that becomes a little bit more uh, involved in terms of analyzing the data. Now, if we keep adding variables, now I'm going to add not only the specific terms for that customer, but also try to understand if that customer has a different payment behavior. If the invoice is, for example, $100 or a $1 million, that might, have, might, might be the case. So I might need to factor that in into my forecasting model. At the end of the day, the goal is to, first of all, increase accuracy and then doing that through automation. As we talk about number of uh, data points, then essentially you can keep adding variables that will impact that 
prediction of when that invoice is going to get paid. And uh, uh, Jacob mentioned before, pre-deductions or early payments are also uh, conditions that can affect when a customer pays and therefore uh, the forecast accuracy. So when you think about adding all these variables and trying to do that in Excel, that's, you can clearly see that it's a very time consuming um, to do it very accurately. So that's, that's where artificial intelligence comes in when in, in terms of making uh, or coming up with a solution for this, this problem. So in order to do that, when we look at the data points, we have uh, two main uh, items. One is customer master data elements, and then invoice data related data fields. So when you combine the two, there's probably about 60 plus variables that you need to take into consideration for uh, your model building. Now out of those 60 plus, then you need to do a further analysis and, and determine the ones that are truly correlated and will impact um, payment behavior and, and when that invoice will get paid. Once you do that, essentially you need to come up with which is the best model uh, to be able to forecast that specific uh, cash flow category more accurately. And we have a, a tool uh, set of about 20 to 30 models. So essentially what we'll do is uh, looking at the data, looking at all those different variables, coming up with the correlated ones, and doing this for thousands of customers and hundreds of thousands of invoices to essentially predict um, when the invoices will get paid. So as you can see, there will, be, there will probably be different uh, cash flow categories and not all of them are gonna behave in the same manner. So what that means is we might, not, we might use different models for different cash flow categories. So for example, AR, right? And we, we, we heard Jacob talk about that their forecast was very uh, short-term driven because those were the invoices that they, they issued and they issued very short-term because of the products get uh, consumed very uh, quickly. So that it, it essentially creates a problem on how do I forecast long-term if I don't have invoices open out to three, four, five, six months. So that's where we come in into basically looking at the, uh, the forecasting model with AI and just combining different types of, of data sets combining a data set for short term, which will be driven by open invoices, pre-deductions, early payments, but also looking at time series of a, of a historical uh, actuals data and predict long-term what, the, uh, what the, uh, the receivables will be for those customers. Uh, Jacob mentioned that they couldn't predict uh, farther than a month because those invoices are not already in the system. They don't exist. So how do we fill the gap and allow them to forecast longer term. That's, that's what we, we use uh, AI models to, to do that. Then there might be other categories that are not um, that critical and we don't use a, a part, we don't need to use a powerful model. Uh, we can, for example, payroll sometimes is, it happens every two weeks and you can use the weighted average of last year and add a growth factor to it for next year. So what we do in that case is we, we uh, our data science team selects, and it goes through a deep analysis on, um, on the data, and they select the right model for the right category. Um, essentially, we're looking for the right tool to solve uh, the problem in an efficient way. As we do that, essentially what we'll do is we forecast at the lowest level. So we talk about cash flow categories, but there's also the component of uh, business units or company codes. We forecast at that lower level, so that it becomes easier to do a roll up uh, to a global cash forecast. So as, as Jacob and the team keep adding new business units, then we keep adding forecasts at that level. And if they want to roll out at a country level or region, it's easy for us to do that. So Jacob, you've gone through a, a journey on going from a, a manual uh, forecasting process uh, that was uh, twice a year, uh, every six months, uh, very manual, uh, uh, difficult to track accuracy, um, so what's, what's next for, for the known North American when, when it comes to forecasting? Yeah, so, I mean, this is really, our solution with Hyredis has really made a lot of things possible for us by taking out a lot of that manual work. So yeah, just very high level, being able to increase the, the forecast frequency. Like you're saying, we we're doing it twice a year to doing it monthly, but then eventually we want to be able to do it daily as well and be able to have our treasury team see that daily cash in forecast so that they can make decisions as well overall to uh, you know, how to have cash management with our entire company. So being able to, to increase that for, uh, that frequency 
And then as we continue to, to grow and, and expand into other entities, so making sure that we have it for all of the Danone entities that we support in North America, and as well as any future acquisitions or other things that Danone may or may not do, um, just making sure that, that we can continue to expand the same forecasting so we can have that flexibility, that efficiency, and that ease with it um, to be able to service the businesses as, as needed, being able to provide that cash in forecast. That's great. Great to hear that. Uh, so a little bit about High Radius. And uh, so High Radius is a, a fintech enterprise software as a service uh, company, which uh, we leverage artificial intelligence based autonomous systems to help companies automate the accounts receivable and treasury processes. As, as we, we saw today, the High Radius integrated receivables platform reduces cycle times in your order to cash process through automation of those receivables and premium process across credit, electronic billing and payment processing, cash applications, deductions and collections. Some of the modules that we see um, on the upper left corner there that um, Danone uses a few of those. Then on the treasury side, um, high radius uh, treasury management applications, essentially we have cash forecasting and cash management that allows you to fully automate your uh, process around cash forecasting. And we have been using artificial intelligence since uh, 2014. So this is not new to us. We use uh, AI in other areas and other modules uh, outside of Treasury as well. So we, we leverage all that knowledge that we have to, to essentially drive a, a more accurate and fully automated cash forecasting process. Hyradius uh, currently has more than 400 customers, including 200 of the global uh, Forbes 2000 uh, companies. So with that, um, Jacob and Stephania, thank you uh, for, for your time today. Thanks everyone for, for joining us to the session to discuss um, the impact of artificial intelligence uh, in forecasting and discussing uh, the specific case of the known North America. So now we're gonna open it to, to questions and uh, open up for the floor uh, to discuss any questions you might have. Good morning, everyone. Um, so again, my name is Juan Saldino, Vice President of uh, Consulting for High Radius and the Treasury Division. So as we saw with Jacob today, um, we have an interesting case of how to leverage a large volume of data uh, related to, in this case, uh, cash forecasting and the use of artificial intelligence. So we have a um, a couple of few questions. The first one is, how do you deal with inconsistent data? So in that case, normally what we do is uh, one of part of the implementation process, our data sciences team, what they do is they will gather all, and ideally will require a list two years of uh, historical data, two to three years. And what we do through that time is analyze the, any data points, if there is exceptions to the data and work on the customer uh, just to see if those exceptions are kind of one-off situation or they're, they're more of a trending pattern that we see in the data. In terms of how long uh, the process uh, took from start to finish, essentially it took about you know, four to six months. That's normally the, the average duration time. It really depends on how quickly we can uh, get the data from, from the customer side, especially around the ERP. And we historical data for banks, um, either customers have them uh, as they load that on the ERP as actuals, or we, we can get that from the banks if they use uh, another TMS or, or they're already getting the data. Uh, the next question is, I have a TMS. Would a company need something like AI-driven forecasts? How is it different from a TMS? That's a great question. So in, in a TMS, normally a uh, TMS environment, what you will see is you'll get forecast data. And I've seen other TMS systems actually doing something similar around just using like uh, an estimated of number of sales at a high level on a specific cash flow category in a day. What we do here is totally different. We go a lot deeper in terms of the analysis of the, the, the data. We get uh, invoice level detail. We get all the open invoices for, I'd say we take AR as an example, uh, which is uh, the case that we did with uh, the non. We take AR, we take all their invoices. We take into consideration the payment terms, uh, early payments, like partial payment on invoices. Um, 
we also take deductions, all that into consideration. So it's not just saying, well, I'm going to pay, uh, I'm going to receive money on this day for this cash flow category it is going deeper at a customer level. Uh, so as you can imagine, there's a large volume of data. So we're talking about sometimes millions of uh, data points and invoices uh, throughout time. Uh, how the, has the pandemic affected the ability to forecast accurately? And this is an interesting, very interesting point. Uh, we've seen in, in some industries where uh, the data uh, has definitely changed uh, based on the pandemics, pandemic. Some customers, for example, have negotiated in terms with their vendors, for, for example, for payment, where they say, well, during the pandemic, for this period of eight months, we're going to extend your payment terms to one more month. So we'll see that reflected in the data. Normally what happens is you'll see that with a, with a short lag in terms of how, when that starts becoming part of the data. Uh, sometimes the customers know that in advance. So we'll work with them on, on updating the models. The next one is uh, how in, uh, what impact have, has it had on investor feedback credit rating? Um, so normally for credit rating, uh, from a customer perspective, we do have Hyrase has other modules that allow uh, essentially to provide rating for customers. So that's outside of the treasury uh, offering. How will changes to real time payments and projects like FedNow affect cash forecasting? One of the things that the models predict when, um, when ideally based on past behavior and, and uh, payment terms for customers, when the payment is going to happen, then one of the things that we require as part of that three-year uh, data set for initially building and training the models is actuals as well. With the actuals and the closed invoices, essentially what we, what we try to predict is, depending on the payment type that was used for that specific customer or vendor, and then when the money hit the bank, and then when the customer's or vendor bank account or account got cleared. So sometimes we see there's a float in there as well, because you might get the, the, the cash today, but your internal team, you, they don't have uh, uh, very advanced tools, it might take them one or two days to clear uh, the cash to the vendor or, or the customer account. So no more we factor that in as well into, into the models. I think for now that covers uh, all the questions that we have. Are there any other additional questions? All right, if there's other additional questions, we'll stay here for a couple more minutes, but definitely appreciate everyone joining today, uh, our session and the Q&A. Um, questions, very, very interesting questions uh, have come up. Thank you.